Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to New Space Chicago. I'm your host, Dave Hurst, uh, Executive Director of New Space Chicago. Uh, we are a, a nonprofit organization focused on uh, supporting and encouraging the space industry in the Chicago region in the Midwest and uh, in encouraging space entrepreneurship. Um, this is one of an ongoing series of uh, networking and speaker presentations that we have been uh, conducting for quite some time um, and uh, in the current conditions now, rather than meeting in person, we uh, have, have uh, chosen this uh, virtual environment. So thank you all for coming this evening. I really appreciate you um, uh, attending. So um, he is an accomplished space technology entrepreneur with extensive experience in many fields, including business development, entrepreneurial strategy, aerospace and mechanical engineering, space architecture, satellite servicing, orbital propellant depots, and a long list of other things that I'd love to go into, and he probably will during our presentation. John Goff started his career as a lead propulsion engineer at a small startup called Maston Space Systems, probably the smallest company building reusable rockets that you've never heard of. Um, but uh, they uh, built some of the first successfully reusable vertical takeoff and landing rocket vehicles. Subsequently, he founded and was CEO of Altia Space Machines, a robotic, space robotics and technology startup uh, where he developed orbital rendezvous and capture uh, robotics and a variety of other satellite servicing technologies. Uh, most recently, uh, Altius was acquired by Voyager Space, Holding, Space Holdings, and uh, John has transitioned to become VP of on orbit servicing, uh, where he is leading Voyager's growth in the on orbit servicing sector and uh, on orbit servicing strategy. So I'm very happy to present John Goff. Um, John, uh, take it away. Thanks. Thank you, David. Uh, let me see if I can. Okay, share this. Okay. Can you guys see this presentation? Uh, we are seeing the um, uh, display mode. I'm not seeing your slides. Oh, uh, not seeing the slides yet. Okay. Uh, Give me a second. Um, sorry, I should have tried this out before. So let me just see. Oh, just screen one. Okay. Try this. Um, can you see the slides now? Yes, we're we're seeing your PowerPoint. Yep. Okay, perfect. And are you guys seeing the normal view, or are you seeing the uh, the the weird presenter view thing? We're seeing the presenter view. Okay, hold on. Uh, Better? There we go. That's much better. Okay. Oh, I did not know I was going to do these weird transitions. I hadn't actually used this PowerPoint uh, theme before. Okay. So tonight, um, just wanted to talk about, you know, this quest I've been on for many years for uh, trying to achieve ubiquitous uh, on orbit servicing and logistics. Um, you know, want to first, you know, talk about like, the vision of like where I think that could take us as a, you know, as a spacefaring society, you know, and then just walk through like, you know, some of my past history in the area and then end up on, you know, where my current company Voyager is focusing its efforts in the auto servicing world. Okay. So first off, you know, let's talk about the status quo. Um, you know, throughout the history of uh, space, like, uh, you know, almost no satellites have ever been interacted with after launch. Uh, there have been a couple of very expensive exceptions, like the Hubble Space Telescope that had some uh, human uh, servicing. But otherwise, almost every satellite that's, you know, built or launched to date has been built or launched in this mode where, you know, you've got a finite amount of propellant. And if you want to maneuver, you're trading a uh, lifetime of your satellite against that, you know, where... Um, you know, it's got to be super reliable, so you're usually flying, you know, already flight-proven hardware. So often by the time you launch your satellite, it's already obsolete, <laughs> and it only gets worse from there. Um, new technology is really hard to infuse into a satellite because, um, you know, you want it flight-proven because if it doesn't work on orbit, like, there's not, not much you can do about it. 
you know, uh, hardware failures, you know, often cut the lack of satellites prematurely. Like, you know, you got that picture of World U4 down there in the corner. Um, you know, it launched, and uh, about six months after they launched, they found out that the batch of uh, controlled moment gyros they bought from Honeywell, I think it is, had a fatal flaw in the bearings that caused them to seize up. And so, like, a year into their mission, like, uh, you know, two of the four uh, CMGs had seen steps, so they couldn't point the thing anymore. And they ended up uh, having to write off three quarters of a billion dollars worth of contracted revenue over the course of a decade. Um, yeah, anytime a satellite failure leads to your company losing half of its market cap and replacing its CEO the next week is a bad week. Um, you know, like, some people started trying to do hosted payloads, but it's a real pain in the neck to integrate hosted payloads, especially if you want to have them across multiple satellites. Um, you know, the situation is getting better, but it's still it's still a challenging dance to take advantage of uh, payload hosting capabilities. Um, you know, there's a couple of destinations that's really easy to get launch access to. If you're going to uh, Leo SunSync, you know, like uh, you got multiple SpaceX transporter launches or, you know, dedicated small sat launch options. So lots of different things there, but you start going to other destinations and it gets harder and harder, especially if you're a small satellite. And then, you know, last one, which was, you know, kind of accentuated yesterday, <laughs> um, the space debris environment is not getting any better. And especially when people like Russia do stupid things like blowing up satellites. Um, uh, yeah, that was really irresponsible. And unfortunately, like without the ability to manipulate satellites on orbit, almost all these problems, you know, you know, there aren't great solutions for. You know, many of these problems, like the solution is, oh, you replace all satellite. Which, yes, if you're mass producing the satellites, that's not as painful. But like, literally, the cheapest, you know, it's like a dove, you know, from, uh, you know, a Planet Labs dove, you know, once include launch costs. Costs more than a brand new Tesla. You know, it's like if, if your cars, you know, if you had a Tesla and the, and the tires pop, you wouldn't say, oh, I'll just buy another Tesla. I mean, <laughs> uh, so that's that's the status quo that we're living with right now. But here's here's where I think we can get with servicing. Um, <clears throat> on the propellant side, now all of a sudden your propellant tank is bottomless. You can, you know, maneuver without regret. You know, if you want to relocate a satellite, no problem. Um, if you found that your satellite's still working and you want to keep operating it, you can keep moving it. If you decide, hey, I'd like to change the altitude and go to a lower altitude where I can get higher resolution pictures for my Earth observation satellite, you can do that. You have flexibility. Like if you're a military planner, you know, you can have your satellites be less predictable. <laughs> um, you know, a friend of mine pointed out, uh, you know, if you'd work special forces and you see in the movies, oh, we'll retask the satellite to get imagery of this site. It's like those billion dollar satellites can do that like three to five times in their lifetime. <laughs> um, every time you do that, you're knocking years off of the usable lifetime of the satellite. Um, but if you knew that you could buy propellant, whatever, like it can totally change the way you operate, you know, allowing you to do things that just weren't even an option before. Um, you know, so. I, that's a big one. Like uh, on the technology obsolescence side, you know, you know things are going to go obsolete. So if you design your satellite where the obsolete, you know, where the components that become obsolete the fastest, you could modularly swap. You could actually design a satellite that you know ends with more capacity than it starts, where it's an appreciating asset instead of a depreciating asset. Um, you know, just a couple of examples. Like uh, I was talking with a company that's trying to do, you know. 12 U CubeSat sized hyperspectral imaging um, and with onboard computing processing. And I asked them about, like, you know, what do you get, you know, when you have to lock a satellite design down, you know, what are you most frustrated about? Like, what are you missing out on the most? And they're like, the processors, you know, because, you know, processors get better all the time. And, you know, they wish they could get the latest and greatest. Um, and, you know, if you had the ability, to revisit the satellite every two years and pop on the latest processor and know that it's like, hey, and I don't have to design this processor to survive 15 years in the space environment because I'm going to be replacing it every two years. It's like you could use 
processors that are a lot more, you know, up to speed. I mean, just one crazy example. Most people don't realize this, but that little, uh, <clears throat> the little uh, um, helicopter uh, Ingenuity that you know flew with the, you know, uh, flew with the most le- recent uh, Mars rover. Like it actually has more onboard computing power than almost every other space probe that NASA's launched, you know, out of Earth orbit put together. <laughs> uh, because it's like you couldn't fly a helicopter with the computing power that they put on most of these other satellites, and it's all because they're using stuff that's rad hardened, which is many generations behind, you know, the latest and greatest uh, computers. So there's things you can do with servicing that you just couldn't do if you knew you had to live with the same computer for 15 years. Um, same with technology infusion. Like, uh, you know, I've seen companies like uh, Surrey Satellite US, you know, or Surrey Satellite pioneered this approach of, you know, they'd have an A and a B string and their A string would be new technology and their B string would be something uh, tried and true so they could at least like get flight heritage for new stuff while having some backup. You know, but it's like if you've got a modular satellite and you've got a risky new technology that you'd really like to try, you can try it out and have like the tried and true as a backup and you can swap it out over time if it doesn't work out. Um, you know, same with repair and recovery. Like, you know, I think it's sad that the company that lost three quarters of a billion dollars to a satellite is one of the companies trying to develop satellite servicing is Maxar Technologies. Um, you know, if they if that had happened, like say five years later, they might have been able to do something about it, and not lost all that revenue. Um, you know, with hosted payload stuff, uh, you know, one of the biggest challenges is timing, like trying to get on the right spacecraft, going to the right place at the right time, and have your payload ready when theirs is ready. Like if you got modular servicing interfaces, you know, you can integrate pretty late in the game, but more importantly. Even if you miss the launch, you could say, hey, I really wish I was on that satellite. And if it's got a port, you know, you have to pay extra to get on at that point. But you could get on whichever satellite you really wanted to be on. Um, you know, the, you know, the biggest one for me also is as you try to get more ambitious with what we want to do in space, like we've got to step up our space sustainability game. Um, I think that we are at a point where and most people don't agree with me yet, but they're wrong. You know, but I think we're at the point where satellite operators should no longer have the excuse of leaving dead satellites on orbit. You know, the you know right now the standard is that 90% of your satellites are successfully deorbited within 25 years of the end of life, and I think the new the new standard should be leave no trace. That like after your mission is over, you dispose of your satellite to an altitude where it's no longer capable of interfering with anyone else's satellite, and if you can't. You buy a tow truck to do, to do it for you. Um, so all of those things are possible, and it's like I think it's going to be critical. You know, you know, remediating the space environment and keeping it clean is going to be critical if you want to do things like propellant depots and you know, Leo space settlements or all sorts of other awesome things that we'd love to see in the coming decades. They're going to be impossible if we completely pollute Leo, and especially if people like the rest. You know, people. Keep doing like what Russia did earlier this week, blowing up a satellite for dumb reasons. Okay, so that's a vision. That's what I've been chasing for like the last many years. So I wanted to walk you through, you know, basically a little, uh, little of my past history in satellite servicing before I jump into where we're at with Voyager. So, um, so actually, my first uh, satellite servicing startup. <laughs> um, happened while I was still at Maston doing the Lunar Lander Challenge. Uh, me and one of my friends started a company. Uh, I think we eventually ended up with Space Infrastructure Company. It was originally TugShip. And we're just trying to look at a business model of, you know, could we, you know, like who had the biggest constellation at that time is Iridium. And it's like, could we find a way to service Iridium? You know, it's like they'd launched their satellites, they'd gone bankrupt, they would come out of bankruptcy. And... You know, they were already way past their design lifetime and their next generation constellation was coming down the road at, you know, was way down the road. And it's like, man, they might need refueling or life extension. Um, so we, we did some research, you know, we, we learned a whole bunch about like how they got fuel into these things and how hard it would be to refuel them and 
you know, long story short, we ended up abandoning this one because like we had the insight that their total revenue as a company was like half a billion dollars per year. And it's like, if they're making 500 million a year, how much would they really be willing to spend on servicing for that? You know, it's like, how much could they even afford to spend on servicing? You know, a couple million bucks. It's like, it, it just didn't look like you could develop a servicing capability to service them in a way that was affordable. So we folded that. Um, you know, it was a side hustle anyway. We were just trying to explore the idea. But that was my first dipping my toes into it. So after I left Maston, which, you know, as Dave was saying, we were doing vertical takeoff and landing rocket. Um, I thought I was starting another uh, rocket company. Uh, you know, one of the first things Altius did was actually, uh, we had the lead GNNC guy from Maston had left shortly before I did, and I picked him up um, at uh, Altius. And we, like one of the very first things we did was the feasibility study for SpaceX for could they do powered landing with the uh, Falcon 9 stage without like massively redesigning their engines. So, you know, we also did the avionics system for the company that became Astra. Um, but we realized pretty quickly that I didn't have the money to start a rocket company. You don't do that with only 10,000 bucks in the bank. And the investment climate was nowhere near as favorable for raising money at the time. So we pretty quickly pivoted to space robotics and satellite servicing. You know, my long-term vision has been orbital propellant depots. And um, I came up with the idea of this deployable capture arm, um, you know, that I called Sticky Boom at the time. I now call it Embark. Um, but, you know, we did some flight demonstrations, you know, worked on all sorts of different non-cooperative capture technologies. So ways of being able to stick to and grab client satellites that weren't prepared for grappling. Um, you know, so we did a bunch of work in that area, supported DARPA Phoenix program. Um, one of the things we came up with is I realized it's like, hey, the technology pieces are here where you might be able to make a satellite that could fly up and dock to another satellite and then deorbit it. You know, so I called it Pitbull, you know, the idea of a you know, dog running up and, you know, <laughs> biting somebody's leg and never letting go. <laughs> um, sorry, it's a little morbid. Uh, we we rebranded later to Bulldog, uh, a little bit more friendly. But, you know, we looked at it, but once again, the challenge is just, yeah, there wasn't a big, of, a big enough market for it. So we kind of let it, you know, fade into the back. You know, we worked on a few other things related to space station logistics and, you know, uh, various other technology development efforts for ULA um, rocket related things. And then something happened. There's this company called Astroscale that announced that they raised 40 million bucks for deorbiting space debris. And I, you know, yeah, I heard about it while I was at a conference that they were at. And I'm like, okay, something's going on here. Either they're really, really clever or their investors aren't. And I'm not so sure which it is. <laughs> so I decided to go chat with them to understand what their business model was because we had looked at it before and it just didn't look like there was enough of a market to go after. And they pointed out that it's like, hey, there's these constellations like OneWeb and Starlink that have been developed that are going to be putting thousands, you know, hundreds or thousands of satellites up and going after like, you know, multi, you know multi-billion dollar you know, uh, telecom markets and they're going to need disposal services for when their satellites fail because they're going to have failures on orbit. You know, Iridium left a third of their first generation satellites on orbit. Um, it's like if they even have a 10% failure rate, that could be, that could be, you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands of satellites up there. And it's like, if we don't have a way of throwing them out of the way, that's going to destroy the earth environment <clears throat> or the low earth orbit environment. And we realized it's like, wow, the market has shifted. <laughs> so we did a little thinking about it and, we decided to try to compete with uh, Astroscale. Um, you know, we, uh, you know, so we did a lot of work with OneWeb. We reached out to them about their interests, and they're like, "Well, actually, we do care about having a backup option for deorbiting our satellites, but we don't know what to put on them." You know, they they baseline putting on this uh, grapple spud that um, Maxar developed that kind of looks like a scaled down grapple fixture for like uh, ISS vehicles. Um, they're like, but it's a proprietary interface. We'd love to have something that's like universal that like anybody can grip to with a wide range of options. But like, if you could, if you could design both sides of the interface, what would it look like? 
And, you know, we're like, well, if you can design both sides of the interface, magnets. <laughs> you know, it's like it's the one way of capturing things that can actually attract at a distance, has a strong grip force, you know, can tolerate a sloppy connection and still get you good grip and doesn't really require a lot on your satellite side. So long story short, we did a lot of work with them over many, many years, and it resulted in this thing up here called a dog tag, which is basically a ferrous grapple uh, plate that you can, uh, you know, that's uh, bonded into a honeycomb panel that you can bolt onto a satellite. And here's a picture of a batch of them, and you can you can see them there, like all those little smiley faces. Um, so it's got an optical fiducial pattern that makes it easy to recognize from a distance. But there's 278 of those on orbit now, so I think it's the most produced grapple fixture in history. Um, and you know, we're trying to at the same time, develop a vehicle to go with it. Because they're like, okay, the grapple picture is great, but what does the other side of the interface look like? And and how would you service this? How can you get the price point down to a point that's affordable? Because it's like, you know, if the replacement cost of one of our satellites is, you know, I, I'm guessing uh, number-wise, but it's probably on the order of like three and a half million for a one-web satellite. And it's like, you know, we don't want to pay 10 million bucks for a disposal. You know, it's like, well, what can you do to get the cost down? And so we developed this uh, servicing vehicle concept called Bulldog that uh, you know, had a magnetic grapple head. You'll notice that the grapple arm is like our sticky boots. So it's an extendable or retractable arm, but with a magnetic capture head. Um, and then we could have another servicing arm to do other things. But it's like, you know, we size this thing uh, to be able to do a deorbit using the same propellant that a one-web satellite had where if we could convince them to also put a cooperative fueling interface on, we could, you know, if their satellite failed prematurely because of an electronics failure, we could dock with them, siphon their tanks, and then deorbit them using the propellant they would have had left over for uh, disposal. And so we wouldn't even have to, like, replenish our own satellite for satellites that have failed from any cause other than, like, a propellant leak or, you know, propellant depletion. Um, so... It was a pretty cool concept. We did some AFRL studies and showed that, like, A, with a vehicle like this, you know, this is one that we felt we could build, you know, after development, that we could build and launch copies of these for well under 10, 10 million a pop, and that we could get enough uses out of this that it's like we could offer them a price point that was competitive, and we could offer, you know, operators and say SunSync, you know, different services that were, you know, really promising. So anyway, long story, uh, so, you know, that was some of the stuff we did at Altius on the satellite servicing front. Um, you know, one of the other pieces, you know, uh, as I was saying earlier, um, the, uh, the one of the guys came to us and said, well, okay, you say magnets, but what do you mean by magnets? What does the other side of this interface look like? You know, we've got a parachute that you can stick to with a magnet, but, like, what are you talking, like a big, <laughs> like, one of those big Acme horseshoe magnets, you know, with a pry bar to pop it off, or like, how, do, how does this work? And, you know, so we had to come up with a prototype real quick that we could show them. And um, I had heard about this really cool solid state switchable magnet technology that Google had been looking at for trying to make a modular smartphone uh, called electro permanent magnets. And I, you know, my marketing guy is putting it together. I'm like, well, go look up electro permanent magnets. I'm sure somebody sells them. Well, it turns out there's like only one company in the world that was actually selling them commercially at the time. I mean, there were some consulting companies that would love to do a consulting project for you, but the only place you could buy them from was this Nicaraguan uh, drone delivery company called Nike Drone. So we bought a few from them and uh, you put it into a prototype, and you know, uh, one of them loved it. And, you know, we were trying to troubleshoot some issues, uh, you know, upgrading the batteries before going to a, a, to a conference. And my marketing guy reaches out to the CEO of Nike Drone asking a couple of technical questions. And he, he starts asking about what we were working on. And, uh, and my marketing guy tells him, it's like, oh, yeah, we're using this for a gripper to, like, grab satellites. And the CEO thought it was so cool. They sent me his resume. And I'm like, wait. I'm a CEO. I've sent people my resume. That's usually a horrible sign. <laughs> What's going on? Long story short, we ended up buying this company. 
Um, the CEO was a uh, U.S. citizen uh, who had just gone to Nicaragua on vacation and loved it and stayed there and started a tech company there and is getting bored of running a tech startup in a third world country. Um, and uh, so we sold his company. We moved him up to the U.S. and we've been developing more and more advanced versions of these electro-permanent magnets. So there, it's a magnet that you can, it's a permanent magnet that you can turn on and off is the best way of thinking about it. Like I, these old ones, like you see these gray strips, like those are each, uh, you know, a, a pole piece, a permanent magnet. It has electromagnet windings uh, around them. And we can pulse electricity through it in a way that ter- that gausses or degausses the permanent magnet. So it only uses power to change states, and it'll stay in that state till the heat death of the universe or until you change it to, to another state. And so we we've developed you know docking systems with it. You know, here's a modular power data interface we've done with it. Here's a cryogenic fluid coupling. Um, this one I I wish I had included the uh, video with it because it was really cool. But this was a um, this is a tool changer. So end of arm tool changer that has no moving parts, no exposed pins. So this is designed to be able to work in a uh, dusty environment, like a planetary surface environment. Um, and it uses the EPMs to latch the halves together. It uses the geometry to react torques. And it has inductive power and data transfer to transfer up to like um, 100, watt, 100, 200 watts worth of power and gigabit data rates uh, you know, through the connector. And all of a something that could be hermetically sealed that, you know, we're not there yet, but like, I think with some refinements, you could get a system that could operate for like, you know, years and years and years on the Martian surface or lunar surface or whatever without maintenance. <clears throat> so anyway, so that's a lot of what Altius was up to. And, uh, you know, we we're a bootstrapped aerospace company, which means ups and downs and leveraging contract R&D and, you know, <clears throat> finally, at a certain point, we realized that if we wanted to go after satellite servicing and bigger missions, that we needed a strategic investor or we needed an acquisition. So we, you know, uh, started shopping the company around, got a couple of companies interested in us. And one of them was Voyager, where we work now. Um, so so we, we sold to Voyager back in um, uh, uh, end of 2019. Um, we were the first company that they bought, which is always risky. You know, it's like uh, there's a learning curve with all startups and uh, holding companies a startup. And we knew we were signing up to be guinea pig. And I can empathize a lot more with guinea pigs now. But, uh, um, you know, back in May, I moved up to the Voyager level and replaced myself because I realized that we needed somebody who could focus on the Voyager level uh, strategy of how do we stitch together all these different acquisitions we're doing uh, for on-orbit servicing. And so basically my role as VP of on-orbit servicing is, you know, I am helping Voyager figure out like what technologies do we need for on-orbit servicing, which of them uh, do we have in-house, which can we develop in-house, which ones should we acquire companies to get? And then how do we piece together those capabilities into, um, applications the market cares about where sh- and where should we focus so a lot of uh, a lot of strategies some merger and acquisition support some investment uh strategy support and then a lot of cat herding you know working with these various companies that have their own distinct visions um and helping them <clears throat> you know helping stitch together a voyager level vision that complements what they're doing and you know helps them be more successful overall so Anyway, so that's what I that that's what I'm doing, and like one of the big pieces I've been trying to do is this whole where do we focus, and um, you know Dave was saying that this group uh, has a lot of entrepreneurs, so I wanted to share an entrepreneurial tool that I'm really enjoying. Uh, it, it's done by the same guys who do like the business model canvas, so it's kind of in that same ecosystem, and so they came up with a technique for uh, you know you can buy the book; it's not expensive. For basically, you go through and you take your <clears throat> core technologies, your unique capabilities, I should say. So those are technical elements. Those could be relationships. Those could be experience uh, bases. And then you combine those. You brainstorm uh, applications and customers and 
therefore market opportunities, which are a combination of the application and the customer. And then they give you a structured method for like analyzing the attractiveness of those markets. Like um, how much potential does the product, does this application and market opportunity have uh, for, for value creation? And then what's the challenge of my organization capturing that value? And then it helps you, gives you a strategic, it gives you a framework for being able to then pick which opportunities to focus on. And then they've got this thing called an agile focus strategy that says, hey, here's your primary focus. Um, and then what's your backup plan in case one of your key technical risks blows up in your face there? Um, so what's a, what's another promising market opportunity that does not share the same technical risks? And then what's your um, growth option? What if you succeed? What if you knock it out of the park with your primary plan? Where do you grow from there? You know, what, what's your follow on? Um, so anyway, so I've been applying this methodology at Voyager. Um, and, you know, what I'd love to go into in the next couple of slides is just where my head's at as far as like the four focus areas that we're looking at on the Voyager level. <clears throat> and I should say where we're at right now in this process is, you know, we've done a lot of customer discovery. We've identified some promising markets, but there's still every single one of these still has some big untested hypotheses that I've got to test. So I haven't yet locked in my final final strategy, but this is like iteration cycle number one. Um, so the four areas that I'm looking at at the Voyager level, and you know, I should say like I was trying to pick things that needed the, the you know all or most of the on orbit servicing team at Voyager. So like if it was something that <clears throat> that just needed on orbit maneuverability, you know, then we would you know, probably let the companies focusing on that, you know, lead that. And if it just needed interfaces or capture robotics, then, you know, maybe Altius would focus on that by itself. But I was trying to stitch together the opportunities that really needed most of the team to work together, that really needed Voyager level coordination. So, so here's the four focus areas that I'm looking at right now. So first one, is what I'd call space facility cargo and host and payload logistics. Um, so long story short, a while ago, I realized like what, one of my insights on propellant depots um, and one of the things that's driven a lot of the invention I did at Altius was an insight that um, a friend uh, from Lockheed Martin pointed out. He said, if you look at the dollars per kilogram cost of delivering a satellite to a ISS like low earth orbit 51.6 degree orbit 400 kilometer altitude circular you got some pretty cheap options you know it's like you're in the low single digit you know thousand dollars per kilogram right now and if reusable vehicles are successful that can drop into the hundreds or maybe even tens of dollars per kilogram he said you know, so take, you know, like Falcon 9, call it 2,000 bucks a kilogram. How much does it cost to deliver a payload to a facility where you have to dock with it and transfer it through? And you look at Dragon, and it's like, you know, Dragon's a $130 million vehicle that delivers, you know, two and a half tons of cargo on a good day. And it's like up in the 40 to 50,000 bucks a kilogram range. And his argument was like, hey, if you're trying to deliver propellant to a propellant depot, you got to do way better than Dragon or it would never make sense. And when I was thinking through like, well, why is it that Dragon's so expensive? It's that, you know, you're cutting into your payload that your Falcon 9 can deliver to orbit. So it's a, you know, it's a heavy wrapper that constrains your payload and it's an expensive wrapper. So it like doubles the cost of your system. And, you know, uh, you know, they sized it for the original Falcon 9 uh, payload capacity. So it's like, you know, it ends up being, a, you know, very heavy and expensive wrapper that, you know, is still the cheapest way of getting stuff to the station right now. But we realized that, you know, if you took a Rocket Labs Electron, put a dumb passive cargo pod on it, use a space tug, um, you know, like Bulldog or, or something similar, uh, to grab that and deliver it to the space station and you know, had uh, the robotics that they pass it in through the Bishop airlock, that you could do that whole mission for on the order of, you know, 12 to 13 million bucks, and you could deliver about 
200 to 250 kilograms of payload. So you're actually in a very similar dollars per kilogram price to delivering a full Dragon, but now you can do it in small chunks, which means that all that can be late load cargo. You know, if you've got a facility after ISS that is starting out and you, and you only have enough demand for like one Dragon load worth of cargo per year, do you really want to have to like guess what all your cargo needs are going to be for a year? Or would you rather be able to buy it in 10 smaller chunks at the same price, you know, in smaller milk runs? So, you know, that one looks promising and you can extrapolate it. Like this is the Lockheed Martin concept with a much bigger, more expensive tug in the you know, MPLM derived cargo carrier. But it's like you can get to much lower dollars per kilogram cargo prices if you got a space tug doing the delivery and you're not like launching the satellite bus and run boom procs off slit uh, system and propulsion system and all that every single time, but you're just launching you know, your, you know, your cargo pod. Um, so that one looks really promising. Uh, biggest challenge we've got there is that all those commercial LEO destinations are still in the future. They've been in the future, and I'm hoping that they really are only five years out at this point, but they could be 10 years out. And so one of the things we're trying to figure out is, does this solve problems for NASA that they care about um, near-term where we could actually have some near-term revenue? But so this one looks promising, and it'll also be really beneficial for doing most payload platforms, which is kind of the next area. <laughs> so Altius is doing those magnetic latch power data interfaces, um, where we were looking at it for like being able to do satellite repair and upgrade. You know, but we realized that like a hosted payload interface looks really, really similar to an ORU interface, but one that can react launch loads. <laughs> um, you know, because ideally what would be nice, you know, from talking to a bunch of hosted payload developers is if you could make an interface that could allow you to plug a hosted payload in late in the developments or late in the uh, assembly integration and test cycle for uh, satellites on, you know, going up. So put it, put it on the ground, have it be able to survive launch loads and carry the payload to orbit. So, um, you know, and, and there's there's been... A lot of thinking along this lines too. Like this is a picture of uh, JPL had this uh, quote unquote instrument hotel is I think the uh, nickname I've heard people call it, um, where you could plug in you know modular like uh, you know washing machine sized instruments onto a space platform, and so instead of having a series of satellites in your A train in some synchronous orbit, you can have a single satellite that has you know, hosted, uh, you know, that has shared services and you're just plugging payloads in that are just the payload. And so you can be swapping in the latest and greatest sensors. You can have them all working at the exact same spot at the exact same time. So you can be looking at things at different, you know, frequencies, you know, with different sensing techniques. Um, anyway, so lots of interesting stuff there. So one of the things we're looking at with Altius um, and Voyager as a whole is both, um, you know, can we get to a hosted payload interface that makes sense for like constellation operators to put on because it makes hosted payloads easy for them to integrate? And then uh, can we then help them by, you know, working with the, you know, uh, brokering hosted payload opportunities on their constellations? Because one of the challenges with hosted payloads right now is you kind of have two options, either A, you can get really integrated with somebody's constellation in advance where they design your system in from the get-go and you launch it. But that only really works if you if you want to put yours on almost all their satellites and they know you're going to be ready at the right time and you know they're going to be ready at the right time. And it's a really delicate dance that um, that's hard to make work. You know, Or you can launch on a condo sat like what Loft Orbital does where they put together a satellite that's nothing but hosted payloads, but they're all ground attached ones, you know? And so the problem is if you're trying to get a con, you know, if you want like 50 sensors spread out through a couple of different orbits, it's really hard to do that as a hosted payload opportunity. So most people either try to raise money to do a whole constellation or they're kind of out of luck. And I think that if you had a standardized hosted payload interface that either allowed you to load it late on the ground uh, where you're not having to do this delicate dance, where it's like, okay, I can get it on any of these satellites would be okay for me. And, you know, you're not as time constrained. You know, it's a standardized interface. So, you know, like you're just designing to a standard ICD. 
you know, the assembly integration of the test is easier. And if you missed your boat, if you missed your launch, you can still pay for like delivering it and plugging it in on orbit using, you know, using a tug. Um, so anyway, that, that one looks promising. Uh, we're still investigating it. And the question is, can we really get somebody to buy it? Can we really design an interface that gets enough traction that people will use it, you know, that can react launch loads, but still be a, you know, lightweight, low impact in interface. And then can we actually make the business side of that work? So there's good questions, but that one looks promising. Um, third one, this one, you know, one of the challenges we've seen with on-orbit servicing is the time lag for cooperative servicing. So the most uh, beneficial servicing you can do is if they've designed a satellite, you know, prepared for satellite servicing from the start. Um, but if you're trying to wrap a business around servicing satellites that are prepared, you know, you've got, you know, a couple of years worth of time selling people on putting the interfaces in and working with them on integrating it and debugging it before it even gets to orbit on their first satellite. And then there's probably a couple of years after that before they're even ready to start buying services from you where they actually would need a refueling or an upgrade or whatever else. And so there's like this big lag between, you know, when you can actually start seeing servicing revenue um, with, pre with prepared clients. And so, you know, the tempting thing is to go after satellites that aren't prepared because they already exist. They're already up there. They're already doing missions or making money or whatever else. Um, and so one of the things that I've started looking at and, uh, and other people have looked at it too, but I've got some ideas here. Um, so Northrop Grumman is the only company doing satellite servicing commercially today, successfully. You know, the only company that's been written, you know, checks from a customer to do satellite servicing and, and cash those checks and delivered on it. Um, and their next generation approach, uh, which is uh, using a vehicle they're doing in partnership with DARPA, its whole idea is um, instead of, flying up to the satellite and docking your whole servicer, you know, to the satellite and then taking over its propulsion and tying up your servicer now for five years. Instead, the servicer has some robot arms and it can grab a dumber servicing pod that they then grapple the satellite and plug this new propulsion kit onto the back of it. Um, I realized that you could take that a little bit further and, you know, like this is a picture, you know, DARPA thought of similar ideas. They call them OAKS, on-orbit attached capabilities, but it's like, you know, if you can clip something to a satellite, you can clip anything you want to the satellite, and there's all sorts of different things you could do with that. And so what I've been thinking about on the Voyager side of things is this idea of um, what I call mod pack. So imagine this is a satellite that has some um, features on, the, on one side of it, on the side that you attach to the client that allows you to clamp onto some mechanical structure. You know, that could be the Marmon clamp ring, that could be the Apogee motor, whatever else. Um, you know, there's different structures you can attach to. And so long as you have something you can mechanically grasp, you have some, you know, we've got some grasping technology that would work really well with that. And then the satellite itself is some basic satellite capabilities, but then a whole bunch of those hosted payload interface ports I was telling you about on the previous slide. And now you can customize this mod pack with whatever the customer actually needs. You know, if it's a commercial satellite that just wants some life extension, you can just put a propulsion system on and you can put a refueling port on that propulsion system. So they now have a bottomless propellant tank. And oh, by the way, the mod, the mod pack comes with a grapple feature that you can dock to. Um, if, uh, for instance, um, you know, say their solar arrays are wearing out or their batteries are wearing out, you might be able to put a uh, beam to power system where you have your own solar arrays and you beam power to their solar arrays and you can augment the power that they're getting from the sun or or at least provide power while they're during eclipse so they don't have to draw on their batteries as much. You know, all sorts of other things. Uh, like, you know, for the military, there's a lot of anxiety about the fact that they've launched a whole bunch of really expensive satellites that don't have any sensors on them that allow you to look around them and see if somebody's snooping on them. You know, they have no neighborhood watch capability. So you can add that after the fact. You know, it's like space is a more condensed environment and you could actually 
put sensors, space domain awareness sensors onto satellites already on orbit and give them that capability that they don't have. And there's a whole bunch of other options. You know, I think I've got a clever way of being able to tap into the, to be able to communicate between this satellite and the main satellite. And if I can crack that nut, then you could do all sorts of things. You could do onboard computing upgrades, whatever, you know, additional sensors, all sorts of things. So, you know, um, the big challenge with this one, so there's a lot of opportunity. I've seen a lot of potential needs in different areas. And so the biggest challenge is these are big, expensive satellites and figuring out how to sell them on something that's never happened before and figure out like which, you know, like th there's going to be a lot of customer handholding with these. Like these are going to be, you know, the mod pack a lot allows you to do some, you know, reusability of the design and stuff like that. You know, but there's going to be a lot of like custom design and it's like figuring out how to do that in a way that minimizes costs and allows them to get the benefits. But I think there's a path forward there. It's just going to take a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, <laughs> missionary work and a lot of uh, um, working with the customers to really help them, under you know, understand what problems you can solve and, and where to go and how much it's going to cost. But um but anyway, so that was really promising. And then I couldn't have a presentation without including propellant depots. <laughs> so my last area of focus, and this one's probably the furthest one out. And this one kind of fits between, you know, the, the uh, one of the other verticals that Voyager is their um, infrastructure vertical, which has nanoracks in it. And they're very into the idea of space stations and making space facilities by repurposing upper stages. And so this is basically a hybrid between a lot of the stuff we've been doing on the on-orbit servicing side and that. And so it's a facility using a repurposed propellant uh, tank to turn it into a depot that allows you to refuel the upper stage and kick stage of you know, a small sat launch vehicle. So um, you can find some papers and presentations I've done on the topic and the orbital dynamics and all of that. But the, the big takeaway is that like you take a rocket lab electron and photon and you launch, uh, launch that rendezvous with the depot and it's got a payload attached to it. Uh, we can refuel that and we can now send like a 200 plus kilogram payload to Mio, Geo, Cis Lunar, Mars, Venus, Neos, et cetera, you know, at, price points that are maybe about twice the cost of launching it to Leo. So it's like, instead of like 25 kilograms to deep space, you know, for, you know, for one price, like, you know, we can get like 10 to 12 times as much payload for, you know, 50% to double the price. Um, so basically give you all the benefits that a large satellite would have of being the primary payload, getting to pick when and where you want to go, um, and not having to herd cats with a bunch of secondaries to make the economics floats, uh, but as a small sat customer. And so I think this one's going to be a big opportunity as well. The bigger challenge with this one is it's, it's a lot more capital intensive than the others. And so like my biggest challenge here is seeing if I can land the kind of uh, anchor customer that could allow us to, you know, raise the money to go do it. Um, <clears throat> so with that, you know, that's kind of where we're focusing as uh, as the organization there at Voyager. And I think that, so why don't I leave this up, but um, uh, Dave, should we open this to questions or? Um, yeah, let's uh, go ahead and open it up for questions. Uh, there's a QA function. Uh, so if people want to enter questions into the, into the QA uh, panel, um, then uh, I, I'll read them and, and you can answer them. So um, while cool. we're waiting for people to submit some questions, I'll, I'll start with some. Um, so one of the challenges I see with uh, on-orbit servicing is related to your last slide, actually, um, which is which is refueling. Um, mm -hmm. a, a servicer is going to be limited by the amount of fuel that it has also, and particularly when you're yep. talking about tugs. Um, moving satellites from orbit to orbit. Um, how do you deal with the significant delta V requirements to position a satellite? And then the servicer has to go back somewhere where, mm -hmm. wherever it came from to pick up the next uh, the next yep. 
payload or whatever. Um, how, how do you deal with those Delta V requirements? Yeah, so, okay. Um, so there's kind of two different environments. So Leo and Neo are sort of similar and then Geo is different. So right. in Geo, in Geo, you've got everything is in the same plane, moving in the same direction at the same speed. So it becomes relatively easy, easy to phase back and forth. And you can spend some extra propellant if you want to move faster, but like you could have a single depot and like basically go to and from that. And that kind of makes sense. Um, you know, and that's like what orbit maps looking at in geo. It's like put a depot up there and then you have some tankers that, you know, can go back and forth between the depot. So that makes sense in geo, but the same yeah. things that drives you to have constellations in Leo drives you to have constellations of servicers in Leo, like cheaper and smaller servicers, and also drives you to have constellations of depots. <laughs> um, so like Orbit Fab's idea for like Leo, which is very similar to what I uh, come up with independently at Altius was, um, you really want to like preposition propellant tanks. Like I'm literally talking, you know, like something smaller than your tug. So like, you know, bolt log, you know, had like a 12 kilogram uh, propellant capacity, um, or, or at least the concept did. You know, like other services might need more or less than that, but you're talking about propellant tanks that are smaller than an ESPA class payload. So the right way for LEO is you want to spread the tanks out a bit. Um, so, and the way I've looked at that is kind of two different options. You know, one of them is you know, the baseline option that like, you know, that Orbit Fab's talked about is they buy up extra capacity on like transporter launches because all those right chair launches always fly with ballast on them and a lot of ballast. Like they're usually flying a quarter full because, you know, people flake out, they aren't able to get their FCC permit in time or, you know, something falls through, um, you know, their payloads running late or whatever. So they have extra spaces that, you know, need something that weighs the same as that payload going up there. And so if you can have that be propellant instead, um, there's a lot of excess propellant capacity on those launches. And so the idea is you put some cannon screws up there and it could be that when your servicer is not busy servicing other things, it's actually grabbing those canisters and distributing them a little bit. You know, so this works reasonably well in like SunSync. Uh, which for Leo, most of the customers are likely to be sunsync. So this is a way you, you can spread it out between you know the two or three main sunsync planes, um, and then you're not having to move as far, you know, to get to uh, customers. So, so that's one option. Um, another option is like if somebody crazy like spin launch, like if, if they work out, um, they're trying to target being able to put like 200 kilograms of payload to Leo for under a million bucks uh, using a crazy uh, sling tether concept. It's, you know, so I'm, I'm not convinced that they're going to eat the, you know, that they're going to like replace everybody for Constellation launch. But like if you can get a dedicated launch where your refueling mission costs less than a million bucks to get up there and you could place it exactly where the tug wants so the tug isn't moving at all, so it's like you finish a mission, you move a little bit away, they deliver the propellant, you chop off, grab any other components you need, and then fly directly to the next mission. You know, then it becomes a lot more manageable. Um, the other piece of it is that like you need you know to service constellations, you need constellations of servicers. Uh, you know, like if you're servicing prepared clients, the servicers can be small sats and can be relatively inexpensive and can benefit from some of the same mass production kind of things. Um, but yeah, you, you'll want to have, you know, like, a, you know, just take an example. If you're servicing one web, um, do the inclination that they're in, like you would actually want to have a servicer in every plane or every other plane and have it be cheap enough that you can use it that way. Um, if you're in SunSync, you can get away with like a couple, some slightly bigger servicers, you know, um, or, or you know, you can also do it with small servicers, you know, uh, because you, things are concentrated in a couple of plans. You know, if you've got a mid-inclination thing like Starlink, orbital procession works more in your favor. So you can get away with, like, one servicer for every three to six planes or so. 
but you're still going to want to have them distributed, and you're still going to want the propellant to be um, probably distributed as well. Um, you know, if you've got a constellation like Telesat where it's mid inclination and high altitude, then you might be having like a depot at a low altitude in the right inclination, and its nodes are just precessing in a way where you get away with one depot and servicers going up and down from the depot whenever it passes by. But anyway, yeah, sorry, I could I could talk about the <laughs> dynamics of depots for a while, but does it, does that give you a high level idea? Um, yeah, the, the constellations of servicers is, is a, a really interesting concept that I, I hadn't thought about it in that way before. Um, it does raise another question, though, which is that are, then um, you may end up having to service the servicers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, uh, yep, exactly. Um, you know, Bulldog was always intending to have multiple modular servicing ports and appealing ports because... I mean, if you had a servicer named Bulldog and you didn't eat your own dog food, I mean, that'd be kind of silly. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Okay. We, we have a number of uh, uh, questions here. Um, so here's one. Um, at what stage of the development cycle is the mod pack? Are there concrete customers in the pipeline? Yeah, that, that was stage. Um, we've had conversations with enough customers. I think that there's interest for it, but I need to circle back with them and you know, like a lot of the customers are going to be government customers. And so what I'm trying to do as the next step is see if I can set up, um, you know, th th there's different mechanisms for you to do collaborative research and development. That's like, you know, uh, for NASA has non-reimbursable Space Act Agreement, DOD has CRATAs. So they have different mechanisms where you can work together where it's like this provide some engineering support, you're providing engineering support, no money's exchanging hands, but you're collaborating. Um, and so what I'd like to do is circle back to the ones that looked most promising and see if I can get some of those, uh, you know, mechanisms set up where we can sit down with them and say, okay, <clears throat> of all the satellites you're dealing with, which are the ones you're most concerned about? And what are the problems? What are the things that bug you the most? And like you know, brainstorm with their people and like look at like works of those satellites, what are the upgrades or refuelings, you know, really brainstorm, you know, the if you could magically change something about your satellite, you know, if you could beam something, you know, if you could had a Star Trek teleporter and you could magically like beam something out and put a replacement in or beam more propellants into the tanks or whatever else, like what are the things that would be on your the top of your list to change? And then try to go through and slog through and say, okay, which of those can we actually change with the mod pack? Um, and then, like, get down to the nitty gritties of, like, systems engineering it and try to come up with a cost estimate and try to figure out, like, is there a business model? Because the biggest problem with a lot of these government customers is they've never bought something like this, so they don't even have a mechanism to buy it yet, probably. So it's like, first, you know, so this is going to be, there's going to be a long sales cycle here. You know, it's going to be figure out like who actually cares enough to talk to me, talk with them enough to figure out like what mod pack they would like and what does that look like? How would they like to buy it? You know, it'd probably be lease, a lease option, you know, would probably be the most promising, but then like, okay, and then get that in front of Congress and how do they actually appropriate the money so they can buy that? You know, <laughs> how do they get somebody aside with the charge code that they can buy one of these things from? So that's a lot of work. You know, that's a high challenge opportunity, but I think it's worth it because like, you know, you look at North Grumman and they're making like 13 million bucks a year off of each of those MEVs. And it's like, if I could sell a mod pack for something on the order of like 10 to 20 million customers, you don't need to sell a lot of those for it to start becoming very economically interesting. And you're conditioning those customers to be used to the benefits of modular servicing. And to start mm -hmm. like, you know, and you're to start and thinking and about Congress, it in that way. Yeah, and you're getting Congress used to creating the mechanisms for funding it. So, yep, cool. So that's that's a, a defense agency customer. Do you see um, a, a similar process in the commercial arena? Um, I I think so. Um, you know, yeah. I mean, that was that was a bit more competitive. I think the biggest opportunities for Modpack right now are in the um, 
you know, civil space in Leo and DOD in Neo and Geo, uh, or DOD and IC in Neo and Geo. Um, you know, like on the commercial Geo side, it's like they mostly care about just the propulsion piece, and you can kind of, you know, like, you know, like uh, Northern Grumman's already doing that in a way that I don't think we can compete with. Like, you know, for the mod pack, like first generation, we might actually even use somebody like Northrop to do the installation. You know the mod pack so that we don't have to have develop our own robotic servicer that can go grapple a non-cooperative satellite and plug the mod pack on, right? So um, there there might be commercial opportunities. I think as we develop more of this, I'll be able to shop around more of what part of the possible is. You know, because if you solve a problem for like a NASA customer that has a really pressing problem that you can solve if they're willing to pay the NRE cost of developing it. Now there's a new capability that's on the shelf that you can say, hey, commercial guys, you can also do this. And we've demonstrated on this NASA mission. You know? um, so at least initially for mod packs, I'm really focused a lot more on the government customer side. Um, though I'm going to keep my eyes out. I like commercial customers. <laughs> you know, they uh, they have different Euro seats, shall we say. Um, yes. Yes. Um, um, I, like, yeah. It's on, on a related uh, question here, um, Space Force recently launched the Orbital Prime program to mm -hmm. spur market for on-orbit services. Um, do you think this will help propel on-orbit servicing or uh, along the lines of what you're talking about, or, or do you see a different impact? Um, I think it'll help. I think it'll definitely help. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of these technology pieces that are within the range that you could reasonably they can get close to developing within like SBIR budgets, and especially the size range they're talking about, where I think about double the size, normal size. Um, so I think there's some real opportunities. So there's a lot of parts of the problem you can break down into pieces that fit that size. So I think it'll help a lot. You know, there's other things like DIU, um, NASA tipping points. You know, so there's some other like mid scale programs and like Oracle Prime, especially since it sounds like they want to do some, you know, strategic finance follow-ons to do flight demos. And that's the key thing is, you know, there's been a lot of SBIR funding for bits and pieces, but uh, you really need the technology demo class. You know, you need, you need programs that are in the $10 million plus to actually, you know, fund getting some of these to flight development, you know, unless you're doing an entirely commercial. And for how nascent a lot of these things are, you know, trying to do that entirely commercial is hard. So yeah, the old gold prime I think will be very helpful. Oh, you're muted. Um, as, as a follow-on question, I, you might have answered this already, but did you take specific steps to validate the market fit before developing the product? And um, you you went over the the. Um, um, uh, where to play methodology. I'm not sure if that is, is, um, would address this or so yeah, fundamentally, how, how, how do you identify the market fit before developing the product? Yeah. So I would say we're in process. <laughs> um, I, I, I'd say that like we, uh, um, we've done a lot of customer discovery to, you know, to try to test all hypotheses. We've got some initial data, but the word play methodology also provides you a lot of really good questions to be thinking through. So what I did with the word play methodology, like the way they recommend doing it <laughs> is you do that brainstorming of all the different market opportunities and you screen it down to like three to five, maybe 10 on the outside so that you can like spend about two months of like detailed customer discovery to really, you know, push through to, you know, how you want to focus. Um, what I'm doing, they said another way you can do it if you have too many opportunities is you can basically do a quick and dirty analysis where you go through their screening based on your previous conversations with people and you're doing a quick and dirty analysis of it, not a detailed analysis, and use that as an iteration loop where it's like, okay, this helps me to know which are looking the most promising, but also where's my biggest knowledge gaps. And then you go back and then you do the two month of really digging into the three or five that floated up to the top. So that's where I'm at is like pick the four or so that have floated up to the top is looking the most promising. And so like over the next like three months, I'm going to be, you know, really trying to dig deep into each of these and figure out like, is there there there? So like, you know, that first one, 
is only really worth pursuing immediately if like it actually solves a problem NASA cares about and would be willing to pay for. It's like we think there's one, we've got a hunch, um, but we need to explore that hunch. And if they're excited about it and they want to work with us and you know, then all of a sudden that becomes a really easy, you know, that becomes an easy win that we could go after. You know, a near term market that has a lot of revenue potential and like provides building block for everything else. But if NASA doesn't care, they're like, oh yeah, that's really cool. And yeah, yeah, sell that to Blue Origin or 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 to yourself at Voyager or uh or to uh Axiom, you know, five to seven years down the road when they're flying their own stations, then that's not a near term opportunity. And that one drops back down to lower in the deck where it's like, yeah, we've got the pieces to do it, but we're not going to stitch them to solution if there isn't a near-term market, market opportunity attached to it. So we're still in that validation process where I've got enough, I've got enough evidence that makes me think that there's a dare there that's worth digging deeper, and that allowed me to sort from like I think it was like 30 different opportunities down to like the four I want to focus on. But I haven't yet gotten to the point where I've validated. Here's my primary market focus. Here's my backup plans. And here's my growth options, which it kind of goes out to the, I can't chase every single one of them. You know, I've got four options and I'm trying to do enough, like in the next three months to figure out which of those become the primary and which are backup plans and growth options. Do you have any uh, intuition about which of those opportunities is likely to be most successful in, uh, I'll say near to midterm? Um, obviously, the uh, the space station one is is an interesting opportunity if NASA uh, is interested yeah. in it. But uh, what what do you think about the other oper- the other? Op- yeah, if I had to guess, I guess options number two or three are the ones that are the most likely to be interesting for us to focus on. I mean, th- there's a bunch of other opportunities that the individual portcos may pick as their primary focus. Um, you know, like, you know, in addition to Altius, we also have a satellite. Yeah, you know, we've got a company doing, like, maneuvering tugs, you know, that we've got a strategic investment in. Um, and so they might be able to go after some of these. But it's the middle two that seem like the nearest term interesting ones for me. Just like the, the, the first and the fourth really depend on having an early anchor customer where there's, like, one or two that could possibly be. And if they like it, then it then it becomes possible and could be totally worth going all in on. But they probably don't. But it's worth trying because, you know, it's like we're trying to fail fast on that because the opportunity is so golden. Um, but like the hosted payload one, people buy hosted payloads. People have done hosted payloads. There's problems with them. We've been approached by some of the constellations that are interested in having a standardized hosted payload interface. So if we can chase that to the ground and come up with something that really works for them and stitches together a business there, and that one seems like it's very likely to work. You know, we've got a lot of evidence. We've got a lot of good partnerships. You know, NanoRaxis, Hosted Payloads. You've got good friendships with Bob Gabriel. You know, I think that that one feels like it's mostly just work to get there. Um, so that one's uh, really promising. Uh, the other one, you know, we've got enough indications that it should be there. Um, and it's just a question of can we get enough of them willing to invest some time with us to brainstorm the art of the possible, you know, over the course of like say six months to like, you know, figure out what their satellites could use, what can we actually deliver, and what would it cost and what would it look like. So that one seems really promising too. It's a long sales cycle, but it also synergizes really well with the host payload one too. So <clears throat> so that's that's where my head's at. Right now, um, this this gets into maybe what might be a little inside baseball for Voyager, but um, obviously you come from Altius, which is now a part mm-hmm. of Voyager, um, and the different options that you're describing um, would those be executed by Altius as part of Voyager, or would this be new business units within Voyager, or, or how, how do you I'm, see that working? I'm still figuring a lot of that out. Um, I think some of these are natural fits for having a lead. Um, like most of these options I showed were ones that involved more than one company. Um, so like for instance, the hosted payload interface one, 
Um, the technology side of it, it probably makes sense for Altius to leave, but the sales channel side it might be more than that, Rex. Um, you know, the, uh, the station precision delivery side, you know, once again, that could be something that maybe Nanorax is the one that's marketing it to the, uh, you know, to the ISS, but it's actually going to be more the tech company plus, you know, maybe Altius for some of the connective tissue between the, you know, the handoff between the tug and the Bishop Airlock. Um, so most of them, at least right now, my guess is that it'll work best if you've got a lead organization that's leading the commercialization. But like one of the biggest challenges is also how do you structure it in a way that's a win for everybody? Because, you know, the ideal structure for a lot of these things for these companies is they'd like to share the upside, not just being a vendor. Right. So it's like you could structure it where it's like, oh, you know, Nanorax leads this thing and everybody else is a vendor and they just make vendor rates. But what would be preferable would be something where it's more of a Nanorax leads this and there's profit sharing involved or something. So I'm still thinking through all of that. And frankly, you know, there's also a lot of learning curve for Voyager on that, um, figuring out what's the best way to structure it. It could be the case that in some cases, it's absolutely best to do it to the Voyager level, where we actually hire some key people at Voyager who are handling the, the marketing logistics of it. And then we're using Voyager portfolio companies to piece together the capability. Um, you know, but in all of those, I'm going to be, you know, as a former <laughs> CEO of one of the portfolio companies and someone who still has, you know, a stake in that, I'm going to want to make sure that they're doing it in a way that's fair to the shareholders, the portfolio companies where, you know, they're getting the entrepreneurial upsides from those opportunities and not just, you know, like being a manager is a great mom and pop small business, you know, but being a hosted payload, uh, you know, broker, you know, or, you know, like, or, you know, broker, brokerage and delivery, you know, firm, like that's a lot more higher margin, a lot more promising. And it's like, you know, infrastructure is at the Voyager level. I'd want to make sure that like the companies that are doing the piece parts are also getting some share of the profit from the entrepreneurial level, you know, because they wouldn't be able to do it without the companies. And um, so that's, my very, very half big thinking on that, but hopefully doesn't get me fired for speculating live on a <laughs> conference. <laughs> I'm so, sorry if I get you in trouble with that question. No, um, no worries. Uh, one, one final question here. Um, so, it, this is asking about how you went about simulating or testing your product from idea all the way to launching. And uh, maybe you you could uh, put that in the context of the dog tag since that product actually is on orbit now. Yeah. Okay. So dog tag. Um, oh, it's saying like, can y'all hear me fine? Right. Can hear you just fine. Uh, okay. Good. Yeah. So it gave me a warning on uh, the mic. Okay. So for dog tags, um, yeah, we ended up doing a lot of you know, iterative development and analysis, um, you know, but in the end, like uh, a lot of it ended up coming down to a mix of functional and space qualification, you know, like for any interface, they're going to care about, is it going to work? And is it going to endanger my satellite? Those are usually the two things I care about when putting on a satellite. So, you know, ours is a passive structure, but it had ferrous material in it and magnets are not something that people normally deal with in space. Um, in fact, they usually try to avoid them like the plague. And so we had to do a lot of work on analyzing things like um, there's this thing called the residual dipole. So the idea being um, if you've ever taken a nail and like, you know, put it next to a permanent magnet and then you remove the permanent magnet and now you can pick paper clips up with your nail. That's because the nail uh, retains some residual magnetic flux in it, has a residual dipole in it. And all ferrous materials have it. It's just a question of how much. Um, and the problem is, is in lower orbit, you're in a vacuum and a magnetic field. <laughs> and so there's nothing to resist you wanting the compass needle other than your attitude control system. And so they want to minimize the residual dipole of your system so that it doesn't compass needle your spacecraft around. So we had to do a lot. Um, simulation analysis, you know, picking the right material that the right properties, 
you know, analyzing it. It looked like it was going to behave right. But then we ultimately had to actually physically test it. So that came down to uh, things like uh, testing stuff in the Helmholtz coil, um, did a lot of BH curve testing for the materials under different thermal conditions to show that uh, that it, you know, that our simulations are valid. A lot of simulations to show, you know, because like they not only wanted to say, hey, if you saturate this thing completely and let it go, drop back down to this residual state, how much dipole does it have is not a problem. But they also said, we have things that generate magnetic fields like hull thrusters and magnet torques on our satellite. How is this going to interact with those? And how is that going to interact with our magnetic sensors? And so we had to learn how to do a lot of magnetic analysis and testing and simulation and stuff. So we got pretty good at that. Um, the other stuff uh, that usually they care about, um, vibe testing. Like anything structural or mechanical, if you want to make sure that it's not going to shake apart on launch. Um, so we've got a shaker table in house. Uh, we also had a TVAC chamber and a thermal cycle um, halt loss chamber. So we, we have different uh, chambers for doing like qualification testing and things. Um, some of it we went out out, out of uh, out of the facility, but a lot of it we had in house. Um, if you're doing any electronic stuff, you're going to care about EMI EMC. So electromagnetic interference and electromagnetic compatibility. Like, is it, <laughs> it going to screw with the computers on, the, you know, start screwing up the computers or, or emitting stuff, you know, that you don't want? You know, is it going to be arcing and sparking and scaring your people? Um, so those are a lot of tests. And then a lot of times they'll have acceptance tests that you got to do, like for production units. And you know, you're trying to minimize those, and hopefully a lot of those are by visual inspection or other. Um, you know, we got a bonded structure with mirrored materials. And so, um, you know, there's several inspection steps along the way. And then there's a sacrificial step where it's like every time we build a batch of dog tags, you sacrifice one or two of them, cut them up, and like do some full tests to make sure you've got good bonding and that nothing's out of spec. So, Anyway, I mean, that should give you a high-level idea of it, but there is a lot of stuff that goes into space fall, you know, taking something from a concept. So, like, taking it from the, we had built a prototype that looked like we thought a dog tag should look like that you could pull on with the EPM gripper um, that we delivered to as a Christmas present to one of them. You know, going from that point to something that's light qualified, I mean, that's still a lot of money. I mean, you know, for a simple structure like that, you know, you, it could still easily be, you know, half a million to a million bucks, depending on, like, what all goes into it. Um, and if it's electronic, it could be even more. Um, anyway, so hopefully that answers that question. That's a, a lot of development for something that, that looks so simple as a, a dog tag. I mean, basically a metallic yeah, plate I mean, with some bonded materials. Yeah, if, if it had been... Um, you know, if it hadn't had the ferrous material in it, it probably would have been, you know, two or three times easier. Because, like, most of it was the, you've got weird materials we're not used to using that have weird effects that we're not used to dealing with. And magnetism is kind of a black art when you really get into it. And there's just not a lot of people who know how to do it. So that was, that was a big part of uh, why it was ex as expensive as it was. That, that, that's a lot of internal competency that you had to develop. Uh -huh. uh, the nice thing unusual is, competency, I should say. Is the future, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. I think we have time for about one more question here. Um, so, uh, cool. has satellite insurance policy caught up to satellite servicing and life extension, life extension um, for lowering or I, increasing risk? I would say it really hasn't yet. I mean, there are some people in the insurance community that are very engaging with the honor of servicing community, like uh, Chris Coon's daughter from AxXL. He's a fellow member of the uh, Confers um, executive committee with me. Uh, Confers is sort of like the uh, you know, trade association for satellite servicing companies. Um, and oh, by the way, yeah, if any of you guys are interested in joining Confers, uh, contact me offline and I can, you know, you know, catch up to speed on all that. But I don't think it's really there yet. Um, and, I, and you know, both the, not just insurance, but also regulatory policy isn't there yet. 
Um, like we're in a period of space where things are changing really, really rapidly. And so let me talk regularly really really personal. Get back to the choice. Sure. Do yeah, I have time to go? Ahead? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like I mean, take space debris. Um, you know, about ten years ago NASA started doing this analysis and it said, Hey, space debris environment's growing after this iridium cosmos collision and you know, the occasional land those have like stupidity. Um, you know, it's like we, we've got a growing um, you know, growing space debris environment. And the only way to actually stabilize and actively go and remove a couple of objects per year. But so long as like most satellites, you know, if we can get to the point where 90% of the satellites are, you know, meeting the 25 year disposal rule and we actively pull like five satellites uh, out of orbit, you know, we should, we should be able to stabilize it and get it under control. So that was where they were at for several years. And then like when we started looking at, uh, you know, services from that, we realized nobody had even started analyzing any scenarios with a constellation bigger than Iridium. You know, so it's like it was like 2018 before anyone had even looked at what happens if somebody wants to put up more than 100 satellites. And by that point, the FCC had already like approved like 20,000 satellites between, you know, uh, all these different, you know, uh, mega constellation operators. And it's like, you know, so they're approving this stuff without even any simulation looking at what could happen. Um, you know, and there are some big takeaways that people realize. It's like, hey, these higher altitudes, you've got to have a backup way of orbiting it. You know, lower altitudes, there's some arguments back and forth, but it's like the regulatory environment's not keeping up with it. And you know what? The now, they're not including the idea of multiple space stations. Right now, they still only analyze it with ISS. You know, if all of a sudden you've got, you know, 10 years from now, you've got ISS and Tiangong and you know, Orbital Reef and uh, Star Lab and, and Axiom, you know, you get to a situation where you've now got six targets the size of ISS that are operating below uh, where 45,000 or 60,000 proposed 100,000 satellites are going to operate. And now those things have to drop down. It's like no one's done the analysis yet on what fraction of their time are they going to spend hunkered down with their reentry capsule like they did for the last two days because that ASAP test. You know, if you got 45,000 satellites, you know, up above you that are being replaced on a five-year cycle, like, you know, that means every you've got hundreds of satellites going up or down, you know, through your orbital band. And it's like, you know, when they're controlled, that's not a problem. But if you're accepting a, it's okay to litter so long as it's not for too long policy, which we've got right now. And what we've got right now is basically saying, hey, you can litter up to 10% of your constellations so long as the litter is biodegradable within 25 years. And that's that's what the 25-year rule is saying. And that means that for the next 25 years, it's okay if 10% of your constellations make everybody else dodge. And no, you know, nobody's looked at what does that mean when there's 20,000 satellites jammed into a 100-kilometer band between five and 600 kilometers altitude. Nobody's looked at, like, what does that mean for station operators? And, you know, is that going to, you know, put an undue burden on them where they can only spend half of their time actually operating because the other half of the time they have to be dodging? You know, it's like, uh, so the regulatory environment is not caught up at all, is not staying caught up with this very well. You know, and it's like, it's, it's part of why you, you notice that on Voyager's list, and like disposal services is not one of the four markets I'm looking at. Probably going to end up trying to support the astro scales and plane spaces of the world because it's like it's too long term of the market because you've got to get regulatory change before anybody will really buy that service on a consistent basis. You know, one who I've announced yesterday that they had a satellite that they're going to pay for somebody to dispose of, maybe, but they're going to shop it around a whole bunch before they do that. And they're still going to try to see if they can get somebody else to pay for it if they can't. You know, and it's like, they're not going to want to sign up for, oh, we're going to do this for every one of our satellites that fails, you know, uh, unless they're regulatorily required to do that because it's responsible. Um, so on the insurance side, um, right now, the problem is most of the insurance that people buy isn't really relevant to satellite servicing risks. So I, the one that is relevant is people buy uh, insurance that usually insures for like the first uh, certain 
launch plus 90 days or something, or I can't remember how many days it is, but like most satellite failures happen either in launch or within like the first couple of weeks of operations. So most people insure for that. And if you've proven the ability to fix a satellite, especially an expensive satellite within that range, then, um, you know, they've, the insurance companies like Axe XL have been pretty clear that it's like, hey, yes, if you can put stuff on your satellite that lowers my risk, then I'm, you know, you know well, yeah. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for sending that. But, you know, so, so they've talked about the ability to put, uh, you know, to encourage good behavior. And, and his preference is penalizing bad behavior, not encouraging good behavior. It's like, you know, we're in an era where, like, if you want to build a car without a seatbelt, like, um, you should be charged a whole lot extra for insuring that. You know, because being, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like, you know, once you've proven you got a modular servicing interface and you've got an ecosystem where repairs are repairs and troubleshooting and attribution are possible if you put a modular servicing interface on and people choose not to do that, that's being irresponsible. So yeah, your logical 90 days insurance rate is going to go up if you don't do that. So there are insurance things they can do there, but the problem is it's like nobody but the UK requires people to buy third-party liability insurance for satellites. And that third party liability insurance only comes into play if you hit another satellite. You know, if you cause the ISS to hunker down for a day in the Soyuz and they lose a day worth of operations that cost NASA 10 million bucks, there's no liability there. You know, no one holds you accountable. No one requires you to have insurance for that. You know, and, like. And, and it gets back to the regulatory environment again. Yep. Because there, there are no regulations requiring that liability well, or, or, and, or assigning yeah. that liability, I should say. Yep. And, and there's also not a legal structure for um, suing people for like, you know, imposing costs on you. So it's like, you know, if ISS had an easy, clean way of going to Russia and suing them and saying, hey, we just wasted <laughs> 20 million bucks on dodging your crap that you idiots put up there by doing a test. You know, set, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, we want to, you know, we will, you know, we want to recover damages from you guys for that. Like if they start setting a precedence where it's like, hey, if I interfere with other people's operations and impose costs on them by not taking care of my stuff, you know, then there would be incentives for people to do stuff. And then there'd be buying insurance, you know, so it's like if people are buying insurance that you know, that satellite servicing helps, then that'll encourage satellite servicing. But right now people generally aren't other than the, you know, launch plus 90 days. And the thing is for launch plus 90 days, constellation operators aren't buying that. They're they're self-insuring by basically building a whole bunch extra and assuming they'll have some launch failures and some duds, you know? So it's like, um, you know, but for bigger satellites, I think that like once there's some consensus on interface standards that work, you know, especially if there's interface standards that are open standards, um, where, yeah, and where there's open standards like that, I think you'll start seeing people who do want to buy launch plus 90 days or whatever insurance, like being incentivized to actually incorporate servicing features that at least allow you to do something, you know? It's like, I don't think XXL wants to shell out, you know, or I keep using them, but I don't think the space insurance you know, they paid out 200 million bucks on that Worldview 4 satellite that had the uh, had the um, CMGs fail. And it's like, if you had a way to just fly up a mission and repair that thing for like, say, 10 million bucks to fly up some replacement CMGs and then plug them into a port or whatever, they would have loved to have had that option. So I, I, I think once it gets to a certain point where it's where it's proven and they know the options there, you'll start seeing them and they might initially, before it's all the way there, I think you might see them start offering some discounts for responsible behavior. But I think they're going to want to flip it over to the, I'm not going to give you a discount. I'm going to charge you extra if you're dumb. <laughs> so. And and I, I can see that as being a, a significant driver, too. Because, as you say, if they could have repaired the satellite rather than writing off the whole thing, that, that mm -hmm. would be huge cost savings. Yep. So, well, well cool. John. That's awesome. Um, Sorry? I think that's all the questions. Yeah, that, that's <laughs> all the questions for now. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so, well, I really appreciate you uh, coming by New Space Chicago this evening. This has been just a super fascinating conversation. And uh, as you know, satellite servicing is one of my main areas of interest as well. So it's really, really great to um, hear from you and, and hear from uh, what about what some of the cutting edge technologies are. So um, yep. I'm going to, uh, in a moment here, I'm going to end the presentation mode and we'll go back back to the floor and maybe we can continue some uh, of these conversations there. Um, but first, let me um, just make a, um, uh, no, 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 not that one, uh, this one. Nope, not that one. Uh, um, all right, let's just do that. I uh, just want to let people know about some of the upcoming events. Uh, so this is our final uh, uh, event for 2021, believe it or not. We are down to the end of the year here. Uh, we will skip December and uh, come back in 2022 uh, with a new series of, of speaker events, um, uh, probably in January or possibly in February. I'd also like to draw everybody's attention to our upcoming Student Space Congress, which will be at the end of April, uh, on the 28th and 29th of April. Um, and this is an opportunity for high school, college, and graduate students to present space-related projects, research, and work to a broad public and industry-specific audience. And um, we're not looking specifically for aerospace projects. Um, it could be other kinds of projects that are also related to space. So. If you um, are a student or if you know students who are doing something that is even remotely space related, um, check out the, the Student Space Congress and you can go to the New Space Chicago website and, and uh, find more information there. So uh, with that, um, I will return us now to the floor.